of you for your very thoughtful questions. I have just a few questions of my own before we uh, open it up for the rest of the panel to ask their questions. Uh, Chairman Arrington, let me start with you. Um, I want to, you know, get your reaction. I've often heard discussion about uh, the debt limit, that raising the debt limit should be done in a, quote, clean way or without any other provisions attached to it. Uh, is it normal for Congress to pass debt limit increases without any changes in spending at all? Well, I would say that the, the best fiscal reforms in modern history have come as a result of negotiating a debt limit. So this, this is not unprecedented. People are, are going to fear monger. They do every time this comes up. But, Chairman, it's very simple. The debt limit is here, and we have to make a decision because it's a check on our indebtedness and the indebtedness of our country and the impact on the future of our country and the future health of our country. And we had a hearing, uh, an oversight hearing in budget. I think every member, Republican and Democrat, agreed our current path, our debt trajectory, is completely unsustainable. Now, we may have different ways to go about it, but if that's true, and we've done this for 100 years and never defaulted, and the most significant, most meaningful structural reforms that have reined our spending and our debt in, I, I don't know why we would, I think it would be irresponsible to move forward without having a good, honest, bipartisan discussion and landing on raising the debt limit, paying our bills, and putting financial controls in place going forward. It's happened numerous times. It can happen again, but it requires leadership. Isn't it, frankly, almost always what we do? When we raise the debt limit, we attach something to it to try and correct the spending that bumped us up against that limit? That, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, so it's pretty common practice what we're talking about doing yeah, here. it is. And obviously, if we pass something through the House, it doesn't mean it'll pass the Senate to be signed by the President. It's an opening position in negotiations. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. This is, we've been asking respectfully for our colleagues and the President, namely, to join us at the negotiating table. We don't have all the answers, but we can all agree there is a big boulder of a problem rolling downhill, and, and it will have catastrophic, and I, I fear irreparable. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Smith, let me go to you next. Um, you know, obviously, um, you used to be chairman of the Budget Committee, so you know the, uh, the situation we face pretty, uh, pretty well. Now, could you explain why it's actually important to begin to address these high levels of debt? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, put, put it this way, uh, knowing our fiscal state, being in debt of $31 trillion and growing, um, that, that creates huge risk. Um, and when you're looking at the proposals to increase the debt limit, a clean debt limit couldn't even pass the United States Senate. Democrat senators have said they would not vote for it. If they could pass a clean debt ceiling like what the president has called for, they would have already sent that over to us. So it is reckless behavior for Biden, House Democrats, and Senate Democrats not to come to the table to negotiate with Speaker McCarthy and House Republicans. They're the ones that's risking the, the potential of a default because they can't even pass that in their side. If they could, they would, Mr. Chairman. Our debt is a huge issue to working class Americans, huge issue. When spending caps fell off in 21, we saw under one party Democrat rule of Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer, increased spending by more than $10 trillion. Increased spending in two years with no caps, $10 trillion. And you know what that, that resulted in working class Americans? Inflation has gone up almost 15% in those two years, 14.9%. Real wages have decreased 3.5% in those two years because of those policies, increasing the debt, 
increasing the spending. And that means every American's paying more to put food on their table, clothes on their backs, and gasoline in their cars. That is devastating. And that is why the American people's calling on Congress and the White House to address this fiscal insanity and figure out some way to come to a common ground. The Speaker and House Republicans have been crystal clear. There's two red lines. One, it's just not going to be a clean increase to the credit limit. And two, there's not going to be tax increases included to it. Other than that, we'll work with you on anything. So come to the table, don't be reckless, and let's accomplish this. So just to be clear, Senator Schumer could pass a clean debt ceiling today if he, if he had the votes? He absolutely could, but he does not have the votes. He has had Democrat senators say that they would not support a clean debt limit. And as narrow as that majority is, they simply don't have the votes. And, you know, you made this point, but I think it's, it's one to drive home. Um, we've had the worst inflation in 40 years. As a matter of fact, it was not just Republican economists, but Democratic economists like uh, former Secretary of Treasury Larry Summers, Steve Ratner, who uh, managed the car crisis for the Obama campaign, Jason Thurman, uh, excuse me, uh, Furman, I said Thurman, Furman, uh, who was, uh, I think, chair of the e Council of Economic Advisors for, for President uh, Obama, all of them warned that American Rescue Plan would result in inflation. And you talked a little bit about this, but I'd like to drive the point home a little bit more. Who gets hurt most by inflation? Working class families who's living paycheck to paycheck. Inflation was 1.4% the month before passage of the American Rescue Plan. When that $2 trillion spending bill came in effect, that's when inflation started to rise. And it's gone up 14.9% since that happened. Larry, Larry Summers, Democrat economist Larry Summers, just like you said, Mr. Chairman, warned that our economy did not need this $2 trillion and it would lead to unintended consequences. And unfortunately, it's at the cost of working class Americans who's just struggling to get by. Thank you very much. I want to turn now uh, again to my favorite chair of, of all the chairs, as much as I uh, admire each and every one of them. Uh, Chairwoman Granger, uh, you made this point a little bit, but I think it's important. I want you to elaborate on April 10th, President Biden actually signed Mr. Gosar's legislation that terminates the national emergency uh, as it relates to COVID-19. I have to tell you, I watch state politics in my state a lot, and I can tell you the state legislature is trying to figure out how to spend huge amounts of money that the federal government has sent them uh, on things that have nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing to do with COVID relief. So can, can you just give this committee a sense of the size of the funds that could be recaptured and, and returned to... to uh, the federal taxpayer, if this bill were to become law? Uh, the last number that we saw looking at that, um, this number you're asking are $60 billion. $60 billion. So since an emergency is over and we don't need that money for that emergency and that's what it's appropriated for, don't you think we should bring it back? Absolutely. Thank you very much. With that, I'll turn to uh, my very good friend. Hey, before you click on the next video, if y'all could do me a big favor and hit that like button. The algorithm loves it, and so do I, because it helps promote these videos and get the message out about what our government has been doing. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications, because every time I put out a video, you want to know about it, right? Thanks again, and have a good one. See you on the next one. Peace.